Good morning. Welcome to God's house today here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. It's great to be with you today and to be with those who are viewing us online. Uh, thankful for this time we have together in God's Word. Uh, we are still in the season of Advent. We're still continuing with our series of When the Lord Comes Near, because Advent means we're waiting for Jesus to come. And today, as you see the, the theme behind me, we hear that when he comes near, he humbles his enemies, which maybe sounds kind of dark uh, at first, but actually it's just the opposite of dark. Uh, it's really good news. Uh, you think if you're a sports fan and the opposing team gets humbled, what do you do? You're rejoicing when the opposing team loses and you win. Uh, today is a reminder that Jesus is coming to make sure that everything that opposes us in the end gets humbled and we get to rejoice because we share in his victory. Uh, the Advent wreath, you know, has those candles on it and this third Sunday in Advent always has the pink candle. And I don't know why, but it always sticks in my head. Someone explained to me once that, well, that's the day, that's the rejoicing day. Because pink apparently is more of a rejoicing color than purple. I'm not sure about that. Uh, I don't know about the colors, but that's what I always remember about the third Sunday. And it definitely fits today. We rejoice today because anything that stands against us spiritually uh, and in our lives, God is taking care of. Uh, and he's giving us the victory that his son won for us. Uh, and for that, we rejoice. So that's going to be the focus of our worship today. And we'll begin by singing our opening hymn.
Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. And in the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And you may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the book of the Old Testament prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3. And here we get reminded again that when the Lord comes near to humble his enemies, which are our enemies, we also rejoice. Uh, we rejoice that he has rescued us from our sins. We rejoice that, really, we should have been his enemies, but he forgave us, and he brought us to be his own children. Uh, and again, for that we rejoice. We read here from Zephaniah, chapter 3. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. This is God's word. And then our psalm of the day uh, sounds like it's a, a different theme because it's getting dark and it talks about crying to God from the depths, but really it's the same thing. We're reminded in the depths of our problems in this world that God is going to rescue us. He is going to hear us. He is going to listen to our cry and rescue us so that we will rejoice in him. So we'll sing together Psalm 130.
of respect for our Savior and King, uh, please stand for the reading of the Gospel. And we will also join in the Alleluia song. Our gospel for today, we see John the Baptist preaching repentance to people and reminding us that as we repent of our sins, we rejoice that God has made us no longer his enemies, but that he will humble his enemies as Jesus wins the victory for us. We read from Luke chapter 3. John, that's John the Baptist, said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. This is the gospel of our Lord. continue with our next hymn. You may be seated. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, are you, are you into the spirit of this leading up to Christmas season? And by that I mean, have you, have you recognized and are you aligned with the fact that as the song said, it's the most wonderful time of the year, that it's the hap- happiest season of all, and that you should be walking around all day with a big giant smile plastered to your face at all times. You should be humming the most obnoxious Christmas carol every possible minute. You should buy the stores empty. You should go to every possible party you can and just love every second of it. At least that's what it seems like you should be acting like, right? Uh, I was looking up pictures of, of people celebrating Christmas, and they're all so happy. Everyone is just thrilled every second of their celebration. I mean, I don't know what they're doing, but they're really happy about it. This kid with the glowing book, he's thrilled. He couldn't be happier about this. She's shopping, and that's even fun. You know, long lines, who cares? We're buying. This is wonderful. Uh, Christmas meal is, is nothing but happy occasions, Not, never a crossword is spoken, you know, among members of the family. They're just happy. And then my favorite of all is this uh, Christmas stock, happy Christmas stock people uh, photo, stock photo. And everyone's just so upbeat all the time. And is that how it really is, though? Because sometimes, because we're supposed to be so happy, sometimes we feel it even more when we're not. Or sometimes there's that disconnect between how it seems like you're supposed to be acting and supposed to be feeling and supposed to be rejoicing with what's actually going on with you. Or even at the very least, being so busy that you feel like you can't stop to take time to be happy. Or because you're hurting. But people don't want to hear that right now. They just want to hear how happy everybody is. And so with that comes our message today from God's Word telling us to rejoice. And and there's a part of us that says, really, though? Can we really rejoice? But yes. And that's why I'm I'm titling it this, because we're telling you, no, seriously. Rejoice in the Lord. But our rejoicing isn't meant to be a fake thing that we turn on, like a twinkling light that we plug in and then it twinkles and plays its happy little tune. That's that's not how we are. No, our rejoicing, which, by the way, doesn't necessarily equal happiness the way the world thinks of it, but no, our rejoicing is connected to Jesus. That's why we rejoice, but we rejoice in the Lord. It's our connection to our Savior that lets us rejoice. It's what he has done, what he has accomplished, the promises that he has made that he keeps on our behalf. That's what lets us rejoice. Not any artificial joy, not a mask that we have to wear, but sometimes even through our tears, even through our struggles, we can see the light of our Savior and what he has accomplished for us. And for that, we rejoice. We're looking at our text today from the letter to the Philippians, and this is sometimes called uh, the Apostle Paul's letter of joy. And you can sort of see why when you see our text, because again, it you could say it lays it on thick with the rejoicing talk. This is the famous verse here: "Rejoice in the Lord always." I will say it again: Rejoice. It sounds happy, but boy, it's it's amazing for me to think about what Paul is going through as he writes this. Because this is one of his so-called prison letters. He's not, you know, home with the family around, you know, around the fire sort of thing uh, that, that we're thinking of rejoicing this time of year. He is, as he writes it in the letters, he's in chains. Uh, Now, it might have been more of a house arrest. Um, It seems like maybe he was physically at times connected to a soldier to make sure he didn't get away. But, I don't know, I don't know about you, but that would sort of put a damper on things. Here he wants to go out and spread the good news, and it's the one thing he can't do. I mean, you'd think a part of him would be like, 
oh Lord, this is so unfair. You know, you've called me to be this apostle going out with the good news, and now again, it's the one thing I can't do. You'd think this all-powerful God could have stepped in and gotten me out of here. But Paul's not saying that. He's saying rejoice. Because again, he's, he's doing what I'm encouraging us all to do today, and that is he's connecting it to the connection we have with the Lord. It's not just rejoice in how great everything is in this world, because it isn't always great, but it's rejoice in the Lord, in that connection we have with our Savior. That's why he says, I'll say it again, rejoice. That's why we say today, no, seriously, rejoice. A real joy in our Savior. And he goes on to explain some reasons why we can rejoice. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Now, this first sentence, I feel like, is worth explaining because it doesn't sound, I don't know, let your gentleness be evident to all. It doesn't exactly to us maybe sound like a strong trait. Someone's gentleness. We sort of picture someone, you know, tiptoeing around, walking on eggshells, as the saying goes. We picture someone who maybe lets themselves get walked all over. You know, no, whatever you want is fine. You know, something like that. But this, the word here in the original language it has to do with a, a quality of not feeling like you need to assert your rights in every situation, right? Being strong enough to help someone else. And again, it's something that we, unfortunately, I think in our society, we have this idea that this sort of gentleness is a weakness. But with our God, it's just the opposite. It's the gentleness that comes from knowing, no, I'm in the Lord. God's got me. He has everything I need taken care of. And if that's the case, I don't need to make sure that, oh, so-and-so, they can't be doing something against me, right? i got to make sure that I'm number one. In the no, I can let others. And part of that also is because, as the second half of the verse says, the Lord is near. And this is kind of our, our first uh, main point today of the reasons why we rejoice is that we rejoice because the Lord is near. But let's think about what that means. You know, think about what it means that the Lord is near, because near is one of those words that it can mean a lot of different things. And I think actually a lot of those different things fit really well with this and fits well with reasons we can rejoice. Again, not rejoicing in the happiness of the world, but rejoicing with that joy of our heart that is confident in our God's love for us. So think about this with, with what it means that the Lord is near for us. I mean, we can say that someone is near and that the Lord is near as in he's physically close to us. And you know what? With, with Jesus, that's true. All right? Jesus promises, wherever two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. So we can say, you know, as we're gathered together here today, is Jesus with us? Absolutely. He is near to us. He is also near to us because, again, his promise was, you know, I will never leave you and forsake you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Whatever it is that we're going through, again, whether it is a happy party or whether it's a time when we're by ourselves and we don't have the big grin plastered to our face, but we're feeling the weight and feeling troubled, Jesus is with us then too. He's near. And also he's near in the sense of the fact that he is coming soon, right? And this, yeah, we think of it, okay, we're, we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas, and that's certainly true, but even more so, and Jesus has promised this, that he is coming soon to take us to our heavenly home. Now, I get that soon can mean a few different things. It doesn't mean it'll be in our lifetimes. It doesn't mean it'll be next week even, uh, or anywhere in between, we don't know when he'll come, but Jesus uses that phrase, he'll be coming soon. And that's another thing for us to rejoice in, the fact that when we look around and, and sort of think, does evil triumph in this world? Does the worst possible thing that can happen in every situation, does it seem like it always happens? We have that reminder that Jesus is going to put everything right. Jesus is going to bring us that ultimate victory where even if we're in our graves, which seems like a defeat in this world, no, he's going to raise us up and we're going to be with him forever. So he's near and he's coming soon. Yeah, that is one of our reasons to rejoice. 
And then finally, this is kind of a catch-all, but, but he's near in the sense that he's still keeping his promises. You know, for example, uh, when Jesus says that, he, when he encourages us to pray, and he says, you can ask your heavenly Father anything in my name, and I will do it. That's a huge promise. And we're going to talk about our prayers in just a minute, but the fact that he is near enough, and we have an audience with our God because of Jesus. He has given us access to our Heavenly Father. We, we should have no right as sinful people to say, hey God, can you do this thing for me? I mean, it's kind of arrogant, right? To think that the God, the omnipotent God of all should listen to us. But because of Jesus, that's exactly what he encourages us to do. Go to him. Jesus says, go to him in my name. He has won us access to our God by his life, death, and resurrection. Right? We have that promise kept that our sins are forgiven. Because that's another thing that can make us not feel like rejoicing when we say, okay, I try to do the right thing. I try to live out my faith, and then I messed up again. And there's a part of us that thinks, Should, you know, shouldn't I be better at this by now? Shouldn't I be able to, to live my life without falling into XYZ sin that I struggle with in my life? And every time that happens and we, we go back to our God, we never have to wonder, is this the time that God says, all right, enough with you. My patience is gone. No, we come back into the arms of our Savior who says he's paid it all. The Savior who said it is finished. The work of salvation was accomplished. Every sin was paid for. Again, that's not our motivation to keep on sinning, but it's our motivation to rejoice that he is near to us, he keeps his promises, he's always with us, and he's never going anywhere. But that's not even the half of it, as our text continues, uh, as the Apostle Paul packs a lot in to these couple of verses here. Uh, but one of my favorite verses here, chapter, or verse 6 of Philippians 4, where we hear, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So a couple things for us to think about here. First of all, that, that thought of do not be anxious about anything. Now this isn't, the Apostle Paul wasn't necessarily trying to follow along with you know, a psychological definition of anxiety or something like that. But it's here thinking about you know, this word in the original language can sometimes mean um, to be concerned about something. And there's certainly an appropriate level of concern that's good to have. You know, if you're if you're in a building and the building is on fire, you should have some concern. Right? You should be concerned and try to get out of the building. All right? that's, that's not a bad thing. But it's when we kind of ruminate on those concerns or those concerns that aren't you know, immediate physical danger, but there's just something that we're not sure what's going to happen, and so our mind goes back and forth on it, and we're sort of rehearsing in our mind, well, how is this going to work, but what if this happens? And, we're, and here, it's not so much, you know, he says, do not be anxious about anything. And if someone's feeling that anxiety, they might feel like, boy, is God just yelling at me now? Stop being anxious. And then, then you really start feeling anxious because, oh, not, now I'm being anxious when I'm not supposed to. But see what an invitation this is. Not a scolding, hey, Quit being anxious. But it's a reminder, you don't have to be anxious anymore. And, and here's why, and here's what you can do. He says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So first of all, we're going to think of it as, as another main point, that we rejoice in every situation. right? Because that's what the verse had said. Now we think about that, there's a lot of situations that come up in our life. Some of them are good and that we're not worried about and that we would never be anxious about, but a lot of those situations, we, we, in our mind at least, we can think there is a lot that could go wrong. So how do I rejoice in those situations? But again, look what, he, look what he says in this verse. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The idea is that in every situation, we get to go to God. As I talked about with that promise of God that he hears and answer our, answers our prayers, we get to go to him. Now, at first that doesn't sound maybe super helpful because we don't see God with our eyes. And we don't, it's not like when we say a prayer that, 
you know, God answers us physically with his words saying, all right, I got you. Just, you know, give me, give me a few days or um, I'll take care of that, but it'll be later. Um, and here's exactly what's going to happen. No, from our perspective, sometimes we pray and it's, it doesn't seem like anything necessarily happens. We can't see God there, you know, listening to us. And we wonder, is this, is this really doing anything? Or we think about the ways that little children ask questions of their parents. And I can remember this when my, when my kids were younger, especially, how kids don't hesitate, and actually they don't hesitate when they're older too, but to ask anything, you know, regardless of how inconvenient it might be for the parents, regardless of how it's a question that that parent could have no possible way of knowing, kids aren't ashamed to ask it of their parents. And sometimes as a, as a father and a parent, it can be sort of frustrating where you think, I, I can't keep up with this. But now think about that with our God, where we're reminded to have that same attitude like a little child who's not afraid to ask mom or dad anything because they know that mom or dad is there to take care of them, that we get that relationship with God, that we get to go to him not just with things that seem like, oh, this is an okay thing to pray about, right? But, but everything in our lives, in every situation, even if it's just, this is supposed to be the Christmas season and I'm supposed to be happy, and I'm not, and I'm worried about this, and I'm concerned about this. God doesn't, says, God doesn't say to us, well, you shouldn't have been anxious anyway. That's, that's terrible. No, he says, bring it to me. He invites us to take it to him. And it's not just... Sometimes people will say that prayer is effective, sort of like a, a placebo is effective, you know, in a medical trial, where if people are given a sugar pill in a medicine trial, because they think it's medicine, they'll start to feel better. Uh, and there's some psychological effects with that. And sometimes people sort of lump prayer into that. They're like, it doesn't matter if anything happens. In fact, the unbelieving world says nothing's going to happen because that's not how life works, is what the unbelieving world says. But, but it might make you feel better because at least you think something might happen. But our God is way bigger than that. He says, come to me in prayer. And like Jesus says, he will answer us. And he won't just answer us, but he'll answer us in the way that's actually best for us. I mean, you think about that. If we pray, you know, I pray that I win the lottery. It sounds good to win the lottery. Uh, but from what I've heard, um, people who win the lottery tend not to be the happiest people in the world, strangely enough. They, they tend to have things go worse for them, sometimes because they think everything should be so great because I've just won the lottery, but then they spin through it, and then they have problems, and then they feel worse than they started with. And so there's things like that that we think we want that God, out of his love, knows isn't best for us and would not allow to happen to us. Or things that we would say, how can anything good possibly come from that? You know, whatever it is, it's a, whether it's a tragedy, whether it's a, a problem in a relationship, when, when we can't, from our perspective, see anything good, we have God's promise that he's still working it for our good, that he has our eternal perspective in mind no matter what the situation is. And it might not be until we get to heaven someday where we can see how any good came from that, but it's still his promise. We can still hang on to it, and we can still bring those things to him. Instead of keeping them, keeping them locked up in our chest, instead of keep turning them over in our minds, we can bring them to him. And we can do it with thanksgiving. To have that attitude of thankfulness that this is the God who loved me enough to not leave me in my sins and not let me be condemned to eternal death, but he sent his own son to pay for my sins? Knowing that he loves me that much helps us even when we're feeling sad, even when we're feeling the troubles of this world pressing down on us, that he can work in us because we're rejoicing in the Lord. He can work in us that sense of thanksgiving, that sense of seeing that he's got it taken care of. He's got me, and he's not letting me go. We can bring those requests to him, those petitions to him, a petition is just another word for a request. He's not saying we have to, you know, bring us something signed by many people. 
It's just that whatever it is we're thinking, whatever it is we're struggling with, bring it to God. He's going to work it out in the best way for us. And then we get the last verse, which is another favorite verse, uh, verse 7, which tells us that, uh, that, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so here we get the last reason that we'll talk about today of why we rejoice, that we rejoice because of God's peace. Now again, peace is another one of those things that doesn't sound super strong and powerful. Um, We think of peace as, as like the absence of war, maybe. So it's like the lack of something instead of something in itself. But again, when we're not feeling that peace and, and you recognize what that feels like to not have peace in your heart, to not be sure about something, and it connects to that anxiety. It connects to that not wanting to rejoice this time of year. But you can feel it when it's not there. But here God's reminding us that it is there. That it isn't just about how we're feeling at the moment, but that his peace is there to bring us his protection and love. Or how it's worded here, the peace of God, which by the way we can't understand because it transcends all understanding, it goes beyond any of that, that peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just like Paul was sitting possibly chained to a literal guard who wouldn't, made sure he couldn't get away, he's reminding us that God's peace is there guarding us. That God sees us in our difficult situations. He sees us when we're hurting and struggling and don't want to smile and sing a happy tune. He sees us and he's there with his peace. Like we, we've talked about that God humbles his enemies you think of all the, the enemies that seem to loom large in our lives, whether it's our own sin, whether it's the fact that, that evil seems to triumph and, and, and bad things seem to happen all the time, all those enemies that, that we see in our lives, God says, I'm there to humble those enemies. And eventually, the day will come when God will bring us to heaven and we will see it with our eyes. And until then, he's not leaving us. His peace is there. The peace of knowing we're forgiven. The peace of knowing he's with us. The peace of knowing he's always keeping his promises. All those things are staying there, guarding our hearts and minds. Friends, that's what we need. I hope you do feel happy (laughs) this time of year. I hope you can rejoice. I hope the smile on your face isn't just painted on or, or with a mask or something like that. Because it is a neat time to be able to do that. But regardless of how our emotions are in a given moment, because they can change, they can go up and down, regardless of how that is in your life, rejoice in the Lord. Right? Not, not necessarily with worldly happiness, but rejoice because of that connection that you have with your Savior. Rejoice that he is near in every sense of the word, and he's not going anywhere. Rejoice in the fact that whatever the situation you're in, good, bad, or otherwise, he says that's a situation that you can bring to him. Bring him your requests. He'll hear you. He'll answer you. And then rejoice because he gives you his peace. His peace that, again, isn't going anywhere, but that will guard your hearts and your minds in him. So this time of year, all times of year, seriously, rejoice in the Lord. Amen. I invite you then to please stand as we will confess our Christian faith in the triune God and we'll do that this morning using the Apostles' Creed. We'll say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Uh, at this time, uh, remember, we, we're not collecting an offering, but there is the offering box uh, in between the, the two entryways there in, the, in, in our entryway. Uh, and also you can give online. And also this time, we invite you to sign the Connect card that you find in each row. And those viewing us online can sign the online Connect card also. Thanks. <laughs> Included in our prayer of the church today, we're going to pray for our Good Shepherd member, Pastor Phil Spouty, who is going to be undergoing a hip replacement surgery this week. Uh, so we'll pray for God to be with him in the surgery and in this time of recovery afterwards. I invite you to please stand for prayer. We'll speak the prayer responsibly together. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the curse of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John. Repent. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Lord, we also come to you today on behalf of Pastor Phil Spouty, uh, who is going to be undergoing hip replacement surgery this coming week. Uh, Lord, we ask you to be with the doctors and nurses uh, who will be taking care of him, uh, give them wisdom and skill as they perform the surgery, uh, but also be with Phil. Uh, be his comforts. Uh, remind him that, that you are with him uh, and that you aren't going in anywhere. And according to your will, g bring success to the surgery as it pleases you. And be with him throughout the recovery time that he will have. Help that recovery come swiftly and help it be complete uh, so that after this he may continue to serve you uh, as is his joy to do. Also, Lord, we ask you to hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
And you may be seated for our hymn. closing prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. And you may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and and receive his gifts to us in his word. A couple quick announcements. Um, We have our third and final midweek Advent service this coming Wednesday. It's at 4.30 p.m. is when that service is. And then our family faith night will start kind of as normal after that. Dinner starting about 5.15 and Bible study for all ages starting at 6. So you're all invited uh, for that. Also, uh, Today we remember that, you know, today is the one day, you know, you stay for the next service. It's completely different content. Uh, We'll have the uh, children's Christmas concert is at the 10 a.m. service today. Uh, So it's not going to be a a quote-unquote regular service. 
Uh, but that's for grades one to eight in our school. And then at 4 p.m. today, there is the uh, preschool and kindergarten Christmas concert. Uh, so be aware of that coming up today. Also be aware today that our, our OWLS group, uh, which is uh, anyone is invited who is 55 and older to this, are having their Christmas party today. They had scheduled it for a day with, shall we say, inclement weather a couple days ago. So that's going to be today, starting at 5.30, and they'll eat at 6. Uh, anyone who's 55 and over, please come and attend. Uh, they're a fun group to be with, and so that the Christmas party will be today. Uh, also, we are, we're having an outreach Christmas concert uh, next, this coming Saturday. Uh, it's at, I don't see the exact time of it here, but you should look up when that time is. There it is. It's at 6 p.m., uh, and you see that registration is required. We want people to register who are coming. Um, so we'd love to have you join us, but, but register. We'd also love some help. We actually don't need a huge amount of, like, really time-intensive help, but we could use some things. The outreach team is working on some things beforehand. So if there's any way you can help or, or bring some little refreshments for it, check that out and, and sign up to help because we could really use that. Uh, we also have an announcement about our coming church photo directory, uh, that Mr. Scott Moss will share with us. Thanks, Pastor Dan. I'm with the Board of Members Support. We had a discussion about, we've got a lot of new members, and thought maybe it's time to do another photo directory. But we got to looking, and we found out that LifeTouch, who previously did our photo directory, was no longer doing church work. So... Our office manager, Dana Summers, did a little checking and found a couple of former employees that, are, that took up the, the, the business and are doing photo directories. I'd like to put in a plug to stop by the, the desk in the Narthex. If you have any questions about the photo directory, it's, it's kind of a nice way to uh, get an up-to-date family photo. Uh, there is a free photo that goes with everyone that comes in and gets a picture, and you can also uh, get extra packages if you'd like to use those for gifts for upcoming events. So please stop by the, the desk and visit with us and we'll get you some more information about getting signed up. The photos are January 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Have a good day, thank you. And one more thing to add that I, I was told that uh, it's important that we sign up because then they'll make sure that they actually send the people to us if we have a big open slot they might decide it's not worth their time to come. So please sign up so we can fill up our slots and fill up eventually our book with your pictures. So it's win-win. Uh, so I hope, hope you can do that for us. Uh, there's some refreshments. Feel free to have some of those. Feel free to greet one another and spend time together as we get to rejoice together because of what our Savior has done for us. So thanks, and we'll see you again.